So uh, this conference is about researchers and the urgent concerns uh, within the research community uh, of this specific field. And we have invited six Swedish scholars uh, to give you a flash lecture of maximum three minutes and also to add a wish list of two minutes where after we'll have a discussion, a common discussion and as before you can post your questions continuously and we'll have them up during the discussion. Uh, and I would like to start by historian Helene Löv of Uppsala University. Thank you very much. And, uh, I would like to dive right into the needs uh, for research. And I fully agree with Professor Hoffman that we need more multidisciplinary research. And we need to come together the different positions uh, that had been uh, dealt with when it comes to this research field and actually talk to each other. That's uh, something that is absolutely crucial. And I also want to stress the need for research on conspiracy theories, for one thing, because that is a common factor in all the different extremists and terrorist mindsets. That's one of the core things, that's conspiracy theories. The other thing is that most conspira conspiracies, they end up in anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitism is the second common dominator, dominating ideological factor. And we really need to address that. We, we really need to address it from a multidisciplinary perspective, but also from uh, a multi-ideological perspective to see the full impact, the full dimension of this, because also conspiracy theories and other things, they are uh, something that we find in society as a large, on an almost epidemical scale on social media. Other areas that we need to look at is the response from groups that are targeted by violent extremism. How do they respond? For instance, once again, the Jewish community has centuries of, of um, experience in coping strategies. That's also central to un in combating. It's also to acknowledge the, the groups and also the fact that certain groups are actually more vulnerable than others and targeted on the multi-ideological multi setting. And I would also like to stress the importance of long-term studies. Long-term studies that where we can compare, for instance, the level of hate crime, the level of different forms of intolerance in society. As it is now, we have one study here, one study there, and it's not possible to compare. So we can actually not say if something is increasing or decreasing. And that's a huge problem. In this country, we used to have these marvelous statistics areas. We don't have them anymore. And that's another problem that is uh, making it very difficult sometimes to analyze. Because we tend to see these things as something that right now it's um, centrum extremist, alternate, uh, alt-right extremist. Oh, let's focus on them. Tomorrow it's, it's uh, Salafists, let's focus on them. Uh, for a short period of time. We don't have that kind of long-term um, perspective. And that's something I feel it's very important also in, in research that we develop not programs, 
that live for two years, four years, but maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years. And programs with researchers from a, from a lot of different academic uh, disciplines and theoretical perspectives. Because then we will get a more lively debate, a more critical debate in many ways. And we also need new researchers. We need uh, doctoral students. We need, maybe we need a national program for doctoral students that they can collaborate during their period of uh, PhD studies. So there is a lot of things that needs to be done and need to be addressed. And also because of the complexity of the situation, we need to look at a number of actors and a number of factors collectively and not get caught in the trap who is the most dangerous ones this week because that will lead us absolutely nowhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Helene. We're noting uh, the taking note of the questions that are coming up. We'll go right ahead and uh, have this discussion afterwards. Uh, it's Christa Matson from University of Gothenburg. Thank you very much. Uh, my research field is uh, prevention of radicalization, in particular uh, toward uh, radicalization into neo-Nazis organizations. Uh, Professor Thomas Johansson and me, we are publishing a book in about two weeks, uh, Life Trajectories into and out of contemporary neo-Nazi movements. And uh, I would argue very much in line with uh, Professor Hoffman uh, that a lot of the interviews that have been conducted with former and still active extremists or terrorists are, are more or less face value. We have to accept their uh, narratives and this is uh, to our mind unsatisfi uh, very unsatisfying uh, so we have uh, it was also quite surprising that nobody came up with the idea yet to interview all other people surrounding these individuals during their radicalization process so what we've been doing uh, not only in this book but in a larger research project is interviewing uh, former de-radicalized, uh, former uh, disengaged but not de-radicalized and still active neo-Nazis, their life trajectories, and pinpointing all the turning moments in their uh, narrative and also pinpointing the individuals that they are mentioning and then seeking these individuals for consent to interview them to have a more nuanced understanding of how this process uh, occurred. Uh, this, I would uh, argue, um, helps us to have a more valid data on, on understanding uh, these uh, trajectories. Uh, two basic and very short conclusions from, from uh, this uh, research is that, uh, one, uh, all these turning points are taking place within relational matrices. It is seldom uh, decisions made by the sole individual, uh, but in a, in a relational matrix. And the re relational matrix are not only parents, siblings, and, and friends, but also teachers, police officers, and whoever may come across them in these turning points. Uh, I would also uh, argue that our research uh, would sustain Viktorovich's very famous idea about cognitive opening, Though I would argue that the cognitive opening might not be that harsh as uh, they are presented in Viktorovich's uh, research, uh, so we would rather refer to it as fateful moments, those moments that we all encounter during our lifetime when crucial decisions are taken, but the uh, uh, conditions when they are taken may not seem to be that stressful or, or harsh, but still it is turning points uh, made in these relational matrix. So this is what we are doing now. So, so we are uh, both producing new empirical data and analyzing it, but also developing the methodology uh, to uh, be able to, to uh, as Professor Hoffman said, uh, not going to try to, to uh, search for the Holy Grail or, 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 or trying to read the Rosette Stone, uh, but just doing 
pure good research, hopefully. I, I would then, w uh, to my wish list, uh, add two points. Uh, the field I'm active in is very much about prevention, prevention of radicalization. Uh, and uh, the bis big disadvantage is that uh, the analysis is that the uh, prevention methodology is based on, uh, is almost completely based on individuals that got on gone all the way. Uh, and um, uh, the life trajectories of those who have gone all the way uh, provide us with turning points and data, understanding uh, how they gone all the way. The problem is that we cannot turn it the other way around. So what caused someone to go all the way may not be good indicators uh, why, uh, other, what direction others are going. So we would argue that we need substantial research in uh, those individuals or fellow travelers on the pathway to radicalization but did not go all the way but aborted without intervention. That is uh, heavily under-researched. And my short last uh, bullet point would be, um, and this is uh, very uh, much linked to, 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 to Sweden, uh, our ethical re review board system makes it utterly difficult <laughs> to, to make uh, analysis of, of individuals within these uh, movements, since it is always asked to have consent from all informants it, uh, if we want to perform uh, uh, research on, on, on the data records. And as you all do realize, uh, is a big combination with uh, that they are very uh, reluctant to give consent, and if you would ask for consent to check them in, in registers, you will put yourself in danger. Uh, this is something that uh, needs to, to be reconsidered. I think that consent should be given by the Ethical Review Board in the same way as it is done in, in uh, big data samples and also in crucial medical research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, int interesting questions. Uh, you can continue to post them, and we'll now proceed to Magnus Ranstorp of the Swedish Defense University in Stockholm. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to uh, FYI and CBE for organizing uh, this collective brainstorming exercise. It doesn't happen enough, uh, and I think uh, it, it is absolutely critical if we're going to move forward. And also, uh, I think uh, Professor Hoffman's uh, comments about uh, having cross-disciplinary teams actually breaking down the stovepipes, not only within disciplines but also between, is absolutely critical. Uh, me and my team, I'm also represented here by Philip Alin, um, we have been working on, on the issue of Swedish, um, uh, Swedish uh, foreign terrorist fighters, their social media use, their financial behavior. Uh, I want to make a special pitch for examining financial linkages because that illuminates the breadth and width of, of, um, uh, of these networks. Um, but also we've had the pleasure of having um, uh, aggregated data in our study on Swedish FTFs uh, from the uh, Swedish security service. So we actually know from the hard data uh, where do they live and one of the issues has been that they do cluster uh, in particular areas. Um, we also did a study on Salafi and Salafi jihadism, and I call the ecosystem. There's a hierarchy, and we often talk about the individual cases. This is organized activity. So how does that look? Um, and, and I think we have pretty good shape. We're in pretty good shape when it comes to knowing what does the, these environments look like. And not just in terms of Salafism or religious extremism. I'm sitting here with co-panelists. Uh, uh, we have a lot of data points, and I would have to say uh, that in the Nordic sphere, we know a lot about these milieus, uh, and that comes to my point, uh, my first point is that yes, we should still look at these milieus, we should still map out what does this space look like, but we do not know a lot about how they function, how do they interrelate, the dynamics across space, time, roles, and trajectories, and the interface between the crime terror nexus, uh, they are enmeshed uh, in one another. So how does that work? We also need to better understand how the global influences, the local dynamics, the flows of transnational networks, because they are not vacuum packed in national environments. 
How do the macro, meso, and micro levels of analysis hang together? We need more rigorous uh, uh, studies on theories and methods in terrorism research. I think we'll, we'll become stronger as a field, uh, particularly uh, bringing in new um, areas. <coughs> Another key area is to focus on not so much the phenomenon, but rather what do we do about it in the, in the prevention and the, in the CV space and conduct state-of-the-art inventory of what do we know, what do we actually know, um, what are the gaps in the research, and what should we invest in our future research. And as I said, the stock-taking in the PCV arena do not happen frequently enough. Uh, I would say that the, res the development side, in terms of security and development, uh, has a very rich um, um, data on how do they confront PVE, CVE in the Horn of Africa, in Pakistan, in other areas that are struggling with these issues. How do you then bridge that expertise with the national expertise? Because we have a lot of diaspora communities. So, so, so that, that would be one area. Um, I do a lot of work also with the EU RAM, and one of my roles is to bridge the gap between policymakers, researchers, and practitioners. And, and I can just say, we do a, a, an annual sort of wish list from the policy making community. Uh, right now, it's, it's about uh, risk assessment tools and their validity. Do the risk assessment tools that we have currently, do they stand up to scrutiny? Are there ways we can improve some of those um, risk assessment tools? Radicalization trajectories, as, as was said by Christopher, life trajectories. Um, Salafism as an ideology, far-right extremism in a digital age um, it is, of course, very critical, uh, particularly um, how far-right extremism, digital hate, migrate into violence and extremism. I see Lisa Carty has done some work, excellent work here, in mapping out that space. And lastly, uh, let me just say also, um, uh, the, the transnational dimension of the far-right extremism in a digital age uh, brings us to the territory of disinformation in France campaigns that serve to corrode and undermine democracies. So we need to understand that. We need to understand how that works in that space. What should we do then? Two bullet points. Cross-disciplinary collaboration in teams focusing on, on pressing challenges. An annual research conference, a national research conference um, where you have collective brainstorming like we have today. Um, to ask agencies to provide a forum funding and research menu. Uh, we have the prison service have a rich research um, uh, program, um, uh, but also it would be interesting, I, it's not a criticism against the Swedish International Development Agency, but, but uh, um, what can we, what can we give uh, what can we get from them in terms of research agenda? I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I'm realizing <laughs> you are Magnus's replacement, right? Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> found out I didn't recognize the voice after a while. You know, standing back here was difficult. Uh, we now have Amir Rostami from Stockholm University and the Institute for Future Studies. Thank you. Uh, I didn't understand, but this, this is Magnus Ramstop standing here. <laughs> so, to be clear. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I agree to a totally other person out there. Oh, Magnus, you're here. And he didn't, you know, he didn't say anything. So. The, the, the pro yeah, the problem is too many Magnus in, in the study of terrorism. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, Amir. Okay, thank you, you thank you, thank you for having me here and giving me three minutes to talk about my own research. This is almost an impossible task, especially if you like to hear your own own vo voice. Uh, I'm also a part of a, a larger research group. I have my dear colleague Hanan Mondani. We have Christopher Edling that is going to present in the afternoon. Anna Edin Ekstrom and several others. So we have created a cross-disciplinary. 
uh, the research team at the Institute for Future Studies coming from different universities. So it's diff a little bit difficult to pick up uh, what's uh, interesting in, this, in, in, the, in the research that we are doing. From my point of view and the interest that I have is the, the extremist, uh, crime extremist nexus. We have very good data uh, provided by the Swedish police, by the Swedish security services and other agencies. And we see a clear nexus between almost every group. We see how left-wing extremists are collaborating with the jihadists. We see how the jihadists are collaborating with the gang members. We see how the gang members are collaborating with, with far-right extremism, and how the far-right extremists are collaborating with football hooligans. So it's the mainstream understanding have been that this is isolated islands or isolated milieus, but our latest research shows that this is rather an ecology of lawbreakers. Everybody is collaborating with everyone. Uh, and it's some interesting question mark is raised, how important is ideology? If even you find links between left and right-wing extremists collaborating in crime. Uh, so the, the importance of ideology and, uh, and so on. And that's a little bit on the research that we are, we are doing. Christopher is going to explain more. We are finding that the mental uh, health is maybe not as so strong indicator as we have previously seen. Only three percent of the of the individuals in the database belonging to the to, to the violent extremists has some records of serious mental illness. Only three percent. And there are many aspects that we could discuss. And when it comes to the needs and the uh, uh, wish list, I, I agree with everybody was suggesting that we need cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary approach. That's also what the research are su su uh, suggesting. But I think before doing a wish list, uh, we, need, we have a homework to do as a researcher. The field of uh, uh, terror studies and the field of research on, on violent extremism is not empirically oriented. There are several research done uh, one very interesting research from 2006 by Cynthia Lim. Uh, she she reviewed 6,041 peer review papers published on terror, uh, terrorism studies, and only three percent of them had any kind of were based on any kind of empirical data. So 97 of percent of them was some kind of opinion. And Newman and Kleinman did the same in 2016 when it comes to radicalization. They found that only 15, 50% was based on primary sources. Um, there are an interesting study published last year from, I think, Schurman. Um, as one explanation why the field is not empirical oriented is that is very few collaborations about between 70 to 80% of the research published is done by single authors. Um, so I think that we need, as suggested here, we need to do cross-disciplinary, but also um, cross-professions. We need more access to data. And the one way is to have, uh, you know, collaborate with agencies, NGOs, but also creating research design to gather data that answers our uh, you know, research questions, and just w uh, instead of waiting for the data to be provided. Thank you, Amir, yeah. uh, for now. And our next scholar and analyst is Anders Strindberg at the Swedish Defence Research Agency. Um, did I manage to turn this on? No. So I'm an analyst, not a. You're anonymous. I was wondering, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, my name is Anders Strindberg, and I uh, work at the Swedish Defense Research Agency in the uh, uh, unit uh, Department of Asymmetric Threats uh, and the Div uh, Division of Defense Analysis, which is a handful, and it's, it's, we have a very interesting uh, work environment. I, uh, me and my colleagues at, at, at in, in that department are working on policy and doctrine issues related to uh, terrorism and violent extremism. And FOI has a uh, outstanding range of experts in other, other fields. 
I think we lost your microphone there. Yeah, very close. We'll do like this, Sanders. I'll interview you. What's on your mind? <laughs> okay, I'll hold that. Um, all right. Um, so, um, yeah. So we have we have a we're really set up for at least in house um, some really beautiful uh, cross uh, interdisciplinary cross cutting collaborative research uh, involving people with technical expertise, ballistics expertise, uh, political science, social science, social sciences. Um, and it's it's um, it is it is heartening uh, to it's it's a good thing to get to be in that milieu in that environment. Uh, I realize now we were asked to uh, prepare one or two uh, sort of wish list points, and I realize that my call for increased cross uh, interdisciplinary research was not entirely original. Um, but I I do think that it's. I do think that it's it's um, hugely important. I think it's crucial for the development of the field as it moves forward. Um, when I got started in 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 this in in research, uh, I was focused on the Middle East. I was um, I was doing research in Syria and Lebanon, and I spent um, uh, quite some time in the, in the Palestinian refugee camps with the groups opposed to the Oslo process, which people cared about at one point. Um, and when I came back to Western academic institutions, it was a choice. Are you a Middle East? Uh, do you do Middle East studies or do you do terrorism studies? And for me, that was, it was the sort of beginning of this uh, journey of binary, um, um, well, it's, it's a food fight. I mean that's that's what it is. It's a canteen food fight in the in the academic world, and it's 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 incredibly unfortunate, especially now as as Professor Hoffman noted, we're moving towards uh, um, more and more towards research in areas where traditional terrorism studies, when we're talking about violent extremism uh, in, in as sub communities as subcultures, traditional terrorism studies may not be set up for that. Right, and so we're looking at new problem clusters, new connections that have already been mentioned that absolutely cry out for this, um, this, this uh, um, a new approach among us. And I mean, it's 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 on no one other than us to uh, who are in this room to try to figure out how, how what the way forward is. And I, I'll just I'll just leave it. Thank you, Anders. <coughs> And we'll, we'll conclude this round of observations by Matthias Wallström from Gothenburg University. Thank you. Uh, can you hear? Yeah? Right. Uh, so I'm a political sociologist and in my research I focus on social movements and political violence but also state control of those two things. And to start off, uh, um, I mean I, I basically ag agree with all the previous presenters but I would also stress the need for not just collaborating uh, with uh, on the topic of violent extremism, but on s working in different areas and also seeing the various continuities between uh, what we deem as illegitimate actions uh, by um, violent extremists and more legitimate or things that we deem more or less on the le legitimate scale, like uh, mainstream politics, legitimate social movements, uh, wars that may be more or less legitimate and, and, and so on, because there are continuities and overlaps that may be obscured if we just focus on this that we define as a very specific social problem. Um, I do research on several different areas, but um, like my two neighbors here, I focus uh, right now on the radical right and um, on how the internet uh, or ac activities on social media may contribute to uh, various forms of you know, high level but also low level forms of radical right violence such as um, at attacks on immigrants and on, on immigrant housing facilities. And, um, 
I, I'd, I'd say that, the, you know, a um, lot of the research that we have been relied on previously was also done on, on the radical right, was due, done during the 90s, where internet and social media was not at all as important as it is now. So we, you know, uh, there's a big surge of research, a uh, lot of research going on, uh, but we're uh, right now compensating for uh, the lack of knowledge on the conditions in the current times that we live in. Um, and social media, uh, as we argue, can uh, both contribute with knowledge, uh, contribute with a general uh, discursive environment that in various ways contributes to uh, radical right violence, um, but also a social and emotional en environment that I think we need to understand better uh, in order to see how that con contributes to um, violent and even terrorist acts. Um, and, but we still need a better grasp of, of these mechanisms, and, I, and we still need, I mean, it's, it's very easy to uh, get data from the internet, or not always, not, not, not to closed groups and, and, and so on, especially for ethical reasons, um, but it's, it's very easy to get a lot of internet data, so we re researchers are, are very fond of doing research on that, but we also need to uh, find the links uh, between uh, offline acts of violence and the online forms of, of activities. Um, and we also need to know more about the people uh, behind these accounts. I mean, we all, we, we're all, uh, you know, intimately uh, knowledgeable uh, about one such person that happens to be president of a, of, of a country um, across the ocean. But Apart from that, I mean, uh, we just assume that, you know, what, what drives people, what, what makes them cross these various boundaries um, that they do in, in, uh, in social media. And we also need, uh, from, a pre from a prevention perspective, we also need more knowledge about how we can intervene. You know, this, uh, th 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 there are these various initiatives, popular in initiatives like We Are Here, with people uh, who uh, enter social media discussions and try to uh, work with de-escalating talk, but there, there's, there's no real evaluation about what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and there's also a, a problem that the state might not be the prime actor that should be involved in that kind of work. Um, two short uh, points on, very concrete points on what, what we need. I'd say uh, wh when it comes to a better knowledge, uh, about violent acts uh, by, for instance, the, the radical right. We need uh, full coverage of hate crimes in, uh, in, in Swedish statistics, not just a half 50% sample, which is currently done and which was done last time in, 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 anyway, um, in order to, more, to do more fine-grained, for instance, geographical uh, an analysis so that we can see in what kind of um, also, not, not just internet environments, but also the local environments that condition this kind of, of, of violence. Um, also, the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency could do better uh, in providing us with, for instance, uh, research um, uh, on, um, that gives us statist better statistics on when asylum centers burn, for instance. Uh, um, through uh, working through their, their uh, way of, of coding that. And also, I, I also think that we, apart from long-term research grants, we also need more international collaboration and grants that are geared towards uh, collaborating internationally uh, in tracking, for instance, how I ideas and information travel within these, uh, for instance, radical right, but also is Islamist uh, Movements. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, we have lots and lots and lots of questions coming in. We're going to jump right into it. But let me just first ask Professor Hoffman, since you're here, uh, what you have been hearing, is that sort of similar to what you hear in the United States within the research community that you're in? Um, yes, I mean, it is, it is, it is similar. Uh, 
There are lots of now, especially government-sponsored initiatives that bring, spe specify that they have to bring uh, different research institutions and researchers with different capabilities together to cooperatively engage in research. But I'd say it's, it's, a, it's a much more recent phenomena. Thank you. So, um, where should we start? Perhaps with this one. Give an example in cooperation between academia and practitioners in Sweden in the field of violent extremism. Well, I would hope there would be many. Magnus? No one takes it up. I mean, we, we are cooperating with CV, who is funding a piece of research. Um, we also, uh, in my other role, uh, within the RAM, we bring together um, uh, practitioners and academics uh, in a, you know, in a stew uh, to try to, to learn from each other. So I, I think that's a lot of, but of course it can be better. And I think maybe academics could um, have an opportunity to be with practitioners, but there are lots of barriers there as well. There are barriers in terms of secrecy. Um, uh, and they're very in terms of trust um, uh, and, and how will the academic information be used. Yep. At the Segerstedt Institute we train uh, what is often referred to as the first liners, teachers, social workers, youth uh, workers uh, who uh, are active in areas where they may encounter uh, radicalization. Uh, and we're doing this through academic courses and this is something that I would like to underline. We are researchers uh, at universities and the way that we usually pass this complex knowledge is through academic courses. I would say that the field as such is uh, overwhelmed with uh, uh, very short courses, uh, two hours lectures and so on and, and you cannot train social workers half a day course really to, to do the job. So if we acknowledge that this is a complex material, we should also provide uh, uh, complex research results in, in academic courses. There is a question uh, exactly on what you were talking about. Uh, does the Public Access to Information Secrecy Act limit the possibilities for research and collaboration between academia and practitioners? I think you've all said yes. Uh, but you were also talking about the Ethical uh, Review Board. Uh, what do you think they should be doing? Uh, uh, they're working under the law, after all. Of, of course. Uh, uh, when we as researchers uh, want to conduct ethical, sensible research, which in these days are more or less everything, <laughs> uh, uh, we have to ask for consent among our informants, and that is fine. Uh, but there are some uh, general acceptance. If you want to uh, do big data survey, uh, you cannot ask for consent for 5,000 individuals. If you are doing research on, 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 on uh, uh, medical condition where, where the informants are, are, are not awake, uh, you, the ethical board review may step in and uh, overtake the responsibility for consent. And then it is uh, a balance between uh, the public interest of the research and, and the potential ethical harm of the informants. And, and, and my experience is, is that they are not willing <laughs> to make that balance when it comes to the informants that we are dealing with here. What we would like to know is, is who are these individuals? Just as Man Magnus mentioned, they pr um, presented an excellent report um, about the Swedish jihadists. We have no equal uh, report on, on the Swedish white supremacy milieu. The Norwegian uh, security police provided one about the in, in Norway in February. But it is not possible to run this through uh, public r registers because the ethical board re review think that we should ask for consent for each and one of them. If there is anyone from the board here and wants to say something, it's, it's possible. It's possible. Uh, we have had a few questions about gender. What, what, what role does gender play in this research? Who wants to jump on that? Amir, perhaps? I can say very short. We have a, a report that's going to be published in January that we are studying female extremists, both in the all three environments, both the Islamic uh, extremists, left and, uh, and right. And we, uh, we see interesting patterns. Uh, we see that the, the women are uh, less educated than men, but they are more engaged into in, the society. As an em employment, they have a lower crime rate and so on. Um, so it's going to be published very soon, where we are focusing on the, the gender issue. Anyone else? Helia? 
I would say that it's in a way, way um, rather uh, an area that's been not been, do, been done so much research in Sweden. Internationally, there's far more research on the gender issues, but uh, we tend to forget the role of women in different kinds of terrorist or extremist groups. We tend to focus on the men which is a, a great mistake, of course, because the role of the women is not as passive as we believe. I have conducted some research in this field um, a long time ago, and it, it's very interesting to see how we pursue the women almost as uh, they have no will of their own. In, in the debate and also in research, that they are just there. But what we re rarely study them, we rarely talk to them, and we rarely study the ideological material produced by women, and not to mention the role women plays inside organizations to keep the organizations going. Uh, the role they play in finance, etc., etc. It, it, it's um, unresearched area when it comes to Sweden, unfortunately. Christian, you want <coughs> to add something yeah, quickly? I, 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 I agree, but we, we should also remember it is not only the role of men and women, but also what sort of masculinity and femininity that are made possible within these uh, en environments. Mm. Uh, there's a question for Magnus. What are the biggest challenges in combating financing of terror? And is there an increased adoption rate in using new payment methods to facilitate transaction between groups, actors? Wow, that's a really interesting question. Um, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, yes, there is there's an interest in new payment methods, but I think we have to go back to the old school. And, and there it's often tied up to identities. So, uh, so uh, in order to, to restrict uh, the availability of identities, uh, that's a precursor for being able to do this. And what we see is that um, there's a lot of financial activity. Um, in some of the cases that we've looked at within the Salafi jihadi community, they are on board of directors. I mean, they are involved in companies. Uh, they are creating institutional platforms, schools. Um, so it's partially, as Amir was saying, it's not some, always about ideology. It's also about the lining their own pockets, or they are distributing money uh, to to other fields. Um, I think also, you know, we have flows of money coming into the country. Um, how does that influence uh, the direction of particular religious faiths? Uh, we also have the flow of money outwards from Sweden. Um, for and uh, you know here we have legitimate concerns about humanitarian the ability to give money. Uh, how do you disentangle that? What are the monitoring mechanisms for being able to make sure that money that they were given to Syria did not end up in ISIS territory? Now, in order to do that, you have to have a highly granulated view of where is this aid distributed. Uh, and, and also, and then we have another issue, and this is my hobby horse, my last point. It, it's about uh, the issue of foundations. Um, Steve still said. Um, now, the different sort of bank secrecy laws and, and, and uh, the availability of information. So we see some of these actors, they, they, they go into um, foundation forms in order to limit the insight of, of the community. In Stockholm, we have 9,000 Stiftelser. And it's, uh, I can't even translate this, Land Sturluson, uh, <laughs> County Board of... Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. County Board. And, and, you know, the amount of people that have to do due diligence mm. is very few. It's, it's, a, it's a monumental task. Mm. So what I'm saying is, yes, it's interesting to look at these new forms, but, you know, these guys are involved in a lot of basic uh, criminal activities, but also... <coughs> Yeah, so it's old school. Uh, you need to get embedded into the land studio, so that. Uh, Anders? Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, am I working now? Yes. All right, excellent. Um, uh, we, we published a report on terrorism financing um, 
earlier this year, and it was essentially it was for the um, National Operative um, uh, Division of the Police um, going through scholarship on terrorism financing and plowing through having to limit it to, to 10 years of, of scholarship, plowing through this material, one thing stood out. Um, it, it, it was incredibly speculative, a lot of it. Um, and, and there were some very, uh, some stellar exceptions, and Magnus, your report was one of those. Uh, but it was one of those exceptions because it had access to actual primary source information from the authorities that that uh, that um, go after these crimes, right? And I uh, we talked a little bit. Uh, Professor Hoffman uh, mentioned this in the keynote. It's been mentioned since the need for some sort of synergy between uh, government agencies and academic researchers is very evident in this particular field. It is not possible to do research in this field without access to the empirical data, which is somewhere in, in government. And so it's a sort of a call, I guess, to government agencies um, in order for academics to be able pr to produce research that is um, useful for policy purposes, for, um, for situational awareness purposes, there needs to be this, um, I, I, give and take is maybe the wrong word, but mm. maybe the right one. Magnus, briefly. Yeah, yeah just want to briefly. I mean, I don't want to contradict you, Andres. Uh, um, uh, I, I agree. But you will. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, um, I, I, it's a compliment uh, because I think we need more data um, from, from government agencies. But there's a lot of data on the finance. Yeah. Um, the, we have a system, uh, I don't know if uh, Professor Hoffman knows, so the system whereby you have a, if you're charged with a crime, the whole investigation becomes public to anyone. The trick is, how do we know that it, it's usually not terror finance? So it's an ordinary fraud. And so you have to have actually police contacts or someone that can tell you, maybe you should go and look over there. Or, you know, this is the context of this individual. So we have, a, we have a lot of data, but piecing it together is a much. really difficult uh, task and, and painstaking um, in terms of just understanding what does this financial ecosystem and, and, and fraud look like. Um. There is one question here. Uh, terrorism is already studied by scholars from various disciplines who also collaborate. What needs to happen to make you, your wish about interdisciplinarity come true? What is missing? And here I want to bring up uh, something that you were mentioning, that, but I also talked to you before, and many of you were really underlining uh, the need for a new institutions, even. Uh, do we need like a, you know an institute like... Um, uh, quality of governments. I mean, one institute is working with these issues, or uh, I mean, we already have talking to Stegerstedt Institute. There are institutions that could perhaps house more and bring disciplines together. I don't know. What do you th what do you say about this? Many of you brought it up. I know Helene did, for instance. You want to start? Yeah, I can start. I think there is a need for not one institution because. There is uh, some benefits with having one big institution when it comes to resources and so forth. But there is also the downside that maybe one theoretical perspective, etc., will be the one. And that's not good. Uh, so we need maybe s several uh, different mini centers or, or research groups and that, that can be constructed in different ways. Because I also think that is one extremely important factor and that is regional and local, uh, the regional and local environment. Because extremism looks different in different parts of Sweden. Different parts of Sweden has different uh, problems. And we also need expertise on a very, very local level. And we need expertise 
in all parts of the country, not just one maybe big institution in Stockholm. Uh, so I'm rather in favor for larger programs that maybe have a scientific board of people from all over the country, but different larger projects or, or institutions in various parts of the country. So regional rather than, than the national only. Magnus? I just want to make a pitch that, you know, uh, I think we're all preaching to the converted. We all feel this is an important issue and we are very grateful. Our funders, one of our principal ones is the Civil Contingency Agency. They've taken a lead role in this uh, and also CVE. Um, I, I, would, I, would all, I would make a plug for, and maybe it's a question for the minister in the afternoon, why isn't there a uh, research program funding for, for, from the National Science Board, uh, sort of large-scale funding, so we can get the plurality of this going in different institutions? That will make this cross-disciplinary uh, moving along. Uh, now we are, you know, we are scattered everywhere, and I'm glad that there is great plurality. Mm -hmm. I'm glad we're all talking together, uh, and this is the purpose of this, and thank you for organizing this. But I think we also need more large-scale funding, um, but also I know that there is in the U towards the U.S., uh, but also within the, in the European Union, um, to bring together, and in the Nordic space, I know there's things going on. In, in uniting research and so on. But I think on the national level, we need to have large-scale funding. If this is a priority issue in strengthening democracy and, and in looking at what do we do about this issue, uh, on all the different environments, we need to have that funding available. Yeah, so rather institutionalize of large funding rather than the institutions where it's done, if I understand you correct. Uh, let's see what we have here. Strindberg, can you speak on the situation in Syria, Turkey, and what this will mean for Sweden? <laughs> the Secret Service wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, I, um, um, oh gosh, that was a, a non-sequitur. Um, the situation in Syria, Turkey. Um, it's bad, right? Well, yeah, right. yes, so that's the baseline. Um, you know, it, it, um, I think the, I mean, the, there's so many um, clouds on the sky right now, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to see, it really is difficult to see the terrain um, in, in the uh, mid to, certainly long-term future, but mid-term future. Um, the possible release of um, additional Islamic State fighters. The, um, depend the, the question of what Turkey intends to do with its refugees, uh, the question of, um, uh, of, 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 I mean, uh, again, on various levels of Iranian designs in, in, in Syria and so on and so forth. There's so many, there's so many question marks um, that um, in terms of its impact on Sweden, um, yeah, I would have to agree. I would have to agree with the security police. It's it's difficult to say, but it's not. Nothing's going to get any better. Mm -hmm. I, I um, the radicalization of um, um, wh what I worry about, and I, we've we've heard uh, people talking about this connection here. Um, the the influx of of whether it's more people who are just simply refugees or whether it's an increase in jihadist activity affects the entire ecosystem of, of radicalism, right? And I like this, uh, uh, Amir mentioned this, uh, the ecology of lawbreakers, but there's also this, um, there's, there's this ongoing spiral between um, Salafi jihadists, between the, uh, the white power, uh, the hard left, and so on and so forth. And it's, it's, it's impossible to predict. Um, I'll, I'll just, yes, leave it at that. Uh, here's a question. It was posted 19 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago. Uh, it might have been for the Secret Service, perhaps, but uh, I'll give it to you. 
what kinds of community interventions are currently in place to prevent violent extremism in Sweden? I think that's a question to Trolle. You, know, you have the overview. Yeah, I, I Jonas, you want to answer I that? Get back to it. <laughs> <laughs> he, get, he gets back to it. Sorry to surprise you. Um, I think it's an important issue, is how do we understand communities? It said community. Uh, I think um, understanding how different communities interrelate with each other, whether they come from different ethnicities, whether they come... Uh, and it's really interesting. You know, um, uh, Per Brinkemo, he's not an academic, he's a, a journalist, uh, I guess. Uh, um, I mean, he, he began studying clans, and the role of clans has become, you know, transnational clans, and so on. So we have all, the, within this sort of space, we have a lot of different conflicts within the community, all cooperation. Um, and how do we understand these communities, the ebbs and flows within them, the community dynamics? That is, um, that's uh, an under-researched issue as well. It doesn't come directly on violent extremism, but it's mm. important, I think, from a local perspective. Matthias. Uh, yeah, I just would like to make a point which is common to, to, uh, to crime prevention in general, that uh, when we, l I mean, obviously there are a lot of uh, high quality initiatives uh, against violent extremism and, and Kista is one of them who's been been developing those, but I think it's important both both when it comes to prevention of violent extremism in particular and in criminality in, gen in, in, in general that it's not necessarily those uh, particular interventions that are called interventions against a particular thing which are the most effective. I mean, having access to good schools and having uh, ways of openly di discussing political and religious issues in schools, for instance, might not be a particular intervention against violent extremism. It might even be less effective if, if it's called that, but it might be a very good in intervention as regards preventing violent extremism. So uh, we shouldn't just look at those initiatives that are focused on particularly this, this the thing. What about this question? What can the study of terrorism learn from f the field of prevention of violence? Did we talk about that already? Hmm. Christo? It is, uh, we're talking uh, related to, to, to this uh, matter. Uh, I, I, there is one thing that I would stress that uh, I found in my research as quite uh, uh, painful. Uh, the uh, former still active white supremacist individuals that are exercising violence, almost all of them, almost without exception, have been victims of, of violence during their upbringing. And it's also true the other way around. Uh, and very few of uh, those uh, who have, uh, have don't have been victims of violence in their home will exercise violence when they are joining the ranks of white supremacist uh, in milieus. So uh, uh, preventing and safeguarding uh, children <laughs> is a very, very, very good idea for preventing violence in general. Uh, <laughs> also for its own rights, uh, 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 obviously. But this connection is, 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 is quite clear and, and quite strong. Uh, also the, the painful voices of my uh, informants when they do not even, even realize when I interview them that they were victims of violence. They, they didn't see it was violence when they were thrown out of the houses without clothes when they were small because they were like <laughs> so very, very painful uh, uh, stories. And I think we have a lot of, uh, to learn from the general prevention of, of, of uh, violence, uh, particularly to with children. Matthias? Yeah, I just, just a short point that uh, ob obviously um, prevention of violence is, for instance, often the matter of conflict resolution. Uh, so. Uh, research in the field of conflict re resolution is definitely important for the understanding terrorism and a very effective way of countering it. Mm. Uh, here's one for you, Amir. Dr. Rostami, is ideology among VBE groups in Sweden not the particular reason for people to join or to stay in the group? Would you rather say it's togetherness, omerta and similar factors? <coughs> 
I think ideology and religions are, are important. Uh, um, it's used as neutralization techniques. Uh, that's well, uh, plenty of research uh, done on it in, in, in other fields. But in, in the qualitative research that we have done, uh, the interviewing uh, different ex um, um, extremists from different environments, we have found that social bond is more important than this is selection bias, those that we have interviewed. So it depending on you know, the level of, the degree of their organizing in the different milieus and so on. But the 12, 13 people that we've interviewed, we've, we found a social bond, a networking relation is much more important. And that was decisive for them to join either right wing or left wing or, or gangs or uh, yeah, the, the uh, Islamic extremists. If um, a radical mosque was close to their neighborhood, they became um, radica radicalized in the Islamic um, um, extremist milieu. If they lived in Borlänge or, or, or Värmland, they became right-wing extremists. So the, the life course pathway mm. engagement to, via, to, to extremists. If the, the social bond was very important. Mm -hmm. And the ideology were, were there, but I, I, the ideology was used as neutralization techniques. As an example, we are stealing goods. That's okay, it's not stealing, it's taking from the enemy. Uh, they're using the, the, the religion and they're using the, uh, the religious texts as neutralization techniques. So it's really difficult to disentangle these different yes, yes. train but forces. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, yeah, I agree totally with uh, Amir. I just would like to, to add that uh, uh, ideology is very important. And, and uh, when I interview uh, those who have not only disengaged, but also dis de radicalized, they downplay the role of, of, uh, of the ideology during the recruitment process and also their whereabouts uh, within the movement. But here's the <laughs> good thing with interviewing the significant others, because they have a different mind. <laughs> uh, uh, not, not only teachers and, uh, and social workers and youth workers, but also siblings and, and, and parents uh, are, are giving uh, uh, the ideology a much more important role in the ra radicalization process than those who <laughs> de-radicalized. Real. What do you say, uh, Professor Hoffman, from uh, togetherness or ideology and how how to say what's more important in from the US. You know all about this. It depends on the individual. I think that, that all these things are factors. There's not one mm. common thread. Some people are religious from young ages. Others are motivated because of their personal backgrounds and how they were brought up. That's, I think, one of the challenges in studying this. Thank you. What have, you, what have we not been talking about yet? You have been answering all the questions almost. Wow. We haven't talked so much about what do we do about it? We talked about what is it. Yeah. We don't talk about the methods we need. No, in terms of the hard methods sort of money, no. uh, picking up the phone, I mean, what? Working in, we have some very good community police officers here. I can see some of them here. Um, what are techniques that they can use in order to engage trust in the community? Um, how do you get resilience in communities? Um, there's a big gulf between trusting between the citizen and not trusting the sort of state. Uh, it's sort of the Engelhardt uh, World Value Survey yeah. between... And, and, uh, and there we are extremists um, in, in relation to not understanding religion and not understanding collective mechanisms. So I think, you know, when thinking through this on the micro level, what kind of methods and techniques could we make life easier for those who are working in the CV space? Um, and, and it can come from mentoring uh, schemes, it can come from, I know Norway, the Norwegian police uh, did, a, did a, a manual on how do, you, how, do you talk, how do you talk your way into houses in, in when you are engaging in order to safeguard children. Uh, lots of things we can sort of, all the work we've done so far in other areas, how can we learn and centralize and give the tools for those who actually have to go and solve this issue. Very good you brought that up. Is there somebody here who wants to say what you actually want the research to do for you? If you're working with the police or social workers or 
Um, just put a hand up and I'll come back with the microphone. Meanwhile, Christo. Yeah, uh, um, I, I, Helene mentioned in the beginning that anti-Semitism is a very important factor and, and I, I think it's worthwhile mentioning it and underlining that a little bit further. Uh, when it comes to if, uh, uh, studying and understanding terrorism, we do separate between um, intentions and means. And traditionally, a se uh, security agency uh, are instructed to incapacitate when there are means. Uh, but intentions are seen uh, as uh, an indicator where means may be built, and therefore a reason to monitor. But then we also think that uh, intentions may lead to uh, a means uh, and we shall prevent intention. And this is w uh, where, I don't know if Professor Hoffman agrees, where critical terrorism studies comes in when policy are targeting uh, the incapacitating of, of intention uh, which might violate fundamental uh, human rights. But however, anti-Semitism is uh, within all the three environments and, and should be uh, targeted uh, and we don't need to prove that there's a relation between anti-Semitism uh, and building up means, because it has its own good <laughs> to, to deal with anti-Semitism, also for the individuals in these environments. I'm about to publish a study on young Palestinians uh, and, and their uh, perception of Swedish society. And, and of, of course, anti-Semitism is, is, uh, is also a factor uh, uh, hindering them to get integrated into the society. So there's a good reason on its own to combat anti-Semitism also for, the, for this sake, but, but without doing the harm that critical terrorist studies may point right, rightly on when it comes to other ideo ideological considerations. How can we reduce the sense of exclusion that has also proved to be the contributory factor to individuals becoming extremists? Well, that's a tough one. Anders? No, it was on, on, the, on the previous question. Yeah, I, I All right. Yeah. No, on the, on the issue of, um, of practical CV measures, because I, I saw something flash past there, um, barely. Um, but I, 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 so CVE in the United States is something that I, I have been involved in for, for quite a few years, when the FBI sort of owned the issue before it was passed over to DHS and then promptly stuck a fork in and they said we're done uh, at, um, at the Department of Homeland Security. But when the Bureau was trying to do this, uh, they had, I mean, so there's some, some key issues emerged with the effort to practically counter violent extremism. One of them was it absolutely has to be a local issue. This is why it continues to fail as a federal effort, right? And so, and Professor Hoffman uh, mentioned this before, where it's been where it's been successful, it's been state and state and local authorities, um, but it's also been about so where, where there's long-term engagement, not a rotation of personnel. You know, um, a bureau agent comes in and rotates out after three years, uh, and so on and so forth. You have to have people who are in the community for a long period of time, who can build up this trust. Um, but in terms of what the successful examples have, have, have done, it has been very much community policing oriented. And it's been about listening to the narratives that problematic groups, the, the stories they tell about themselves and the world they live in, and actively trying to engage in that, trying to mitigate fears, trying to um, perhaps act in different ways, patrol in, different, in, in, in a different manner, staff uh, staff stations differently and so, so on and so forth and also to not direct it at just one community because that clearly when CVE came up as an issue in the United States it was about one particular uh, group, uh, group in society and I mean they figured that out pretty quickly that CVE was about was about making sure that Islamic communities, Islamic centers didn't, didn't radicalize. So where, but, so where it's done, been done successfully, uh, they haven't focused on one community. They've done the same for all communities, whether they've had, perceived them as having a problem or not. Um, and and that, that seems to have been certainly part of the success in uh, one of the places is Las Vegas, um, and um, of all places. 
and uh, and but but li attentively listening to the stories these people tell, but also broadening the effort so that it's not uh, by its own nature targeting a community. Magnus. I just want to come back to that question about the exclusion issue. Mm -hmm. I think the difficulty is in discussing it in isolation is that violent extremism is embedded within these socially vulnerable areas. And there, extremism is maybe not the biggest issue. It's, it's gang criminality, it's all these other things. Unless you shift that environment, you have to do it together. If, if you just work on a sort of a piecemeal way of, on, on extremism, you're not going to get that, that sort of trust. So it has to be a holistic way. Of course you can work away it individually, but it's going to be much more difficult. And I think uh, maybe the police officers here would say that one of the things uh, uh, they often say uh, it's the most difficult is that, uh, you know, is the issue of trust of, of authorities because authorities have moved out. And therefore, one of the issues that the way you can work on this issue is you have to work from bottom up also, as, and also from the top down. Bottom up in terms of housing associations. Uh, and this is not about working on CV issues, it's about providing um, a sense of belonging locally, um, giving the skill set of feeling included and so on. Uh, and then you've done that successfully in, in turning areas around, but also um, uh, in, in uh, successfully minimizing this gap. Here's a question. Can you expect that all first-line practitioners know how to deal with uh, CVE, or do you need specialists? I quite don't understand that question. Jonas? I, I believe that the, the, the questioner is, I, I think that's where we come in as a center. We should uh, try to, to spread out the knowledge from the expertise and be that link between uh, uh, the, the local uh, workers, uh, the link between them and, and the expertise, because otherwise it's, uh, it's uh, in some cases, it's quite difficult to, to reach out to, 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 to everyone. So, so we, we try to do our best in order to arrange different and uh, um, uh, more specified uh, arrangement for each and others uh, out in the municipalities and within the police and so on. Uh, I have, we take one more question. I guess that has to be the last one. Um, since Secret Service said we had at least a few days before it it's, uh, might get uh, difficult. The municipalities are highlighted as not being prepared in different aspects. Uh, for example, ISIS 2.0. Do you have constructive thoughts on that, Amir? No, I don't know. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm laughing because I tweeted that yesterday. It's not exactly the, the words, but I, I, I'm thinking... <coughs> My worrying is that I, I was when ISIS 1.0 emerged, and I was working with these issues at the governmental level, and the, uh, the preparedness was not there. And we have had now a couple of years, and my question is: Are we prepared for the next next phase of extremism? Either is ISIS 2.0, or is other phases? Are we prepared? Do we, you know, uh, we, we are seeing what's happening in Syria and uh, oh, do we have enough knowledge? Do we have enough resources? Do we have enough research? So that was m more or less a, a question and then a comment. All right. Does anyone want to add to this? Well, Jonas, come up here and you'll have your microphone on your own. Definitely be done, of course. Yeah. But uh, from our experience, the preparation is it's quite good, actually. And, and the awareness is quite good. But we, we need to bear in mind that the, the people out in the municipalities and, and authorities, they also deal with other things. So we need to, to, to give them glasses, thoughts, uh, knowledge about this. Uh, uh, but we, we need to uh, understand that this is one issue for them. This is one question. But, but I would say it's much better than I thought when I started. Uh, the, the preparedness uh, within the municipalities. It's better, but it's, of course, it's going to always be uh, even better. Hmm? 
Thank you. And thank you all. We're going to now have, uh, before you give them a warm applause, which you will, uh, I will just want to say that we will, you'll have one hour for lunch and we will start at 12.55 precisely in here. And then we'll have the minister, for instance. Thank you.